This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Blood Red Podcast with myself, Sean Bradbury, back on hosting duties. Absolutely delighted to say we have got the perfect hat trick for you today, as I am joined by none other than Joe Rimmer and Paul Gorse to discuss all the latest developments at Anfield and elsewhere. Gents, we'll start with you, Gorsley. How are you getting on? Not bad. Yeah, um, Reds are back in training, aren't they? Seems to be a little bit of movement and news going on at the moment, so plenty to get stuck into. And then, uh, yeah, look forward to this one with the, the three wise men, as you say. <laughs> and Joe, you, I think you're sporting your New Balance gear there still. Your Nike yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My 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 long-standing ties with New Balance aren't going anywhere. Still, <laughs> still a big fan of, of New Balance, unless anyone from Nike wants to send me free stuff. In which case, I'll swap out straight away. Anything, anything going for free, and I'm, I'm onto it. Hey, sure, just sit up a little bit. You, you're sort of like peeping over your um your video here. I can only see your eyes. Is that uh, okay? Let me let me adjust my screen. Is that is that better? There we go. There we go. Yeah. There you go. Come on. Everyone wants everyone wants to see full Sean. <laughs> there you yeah. go. You, you've yeah. got you've got all of it. All the smile and face to see now. Uh, yeah, so plenty to get through today. We will, of course, be discussing Thiago Alcantara, the rumor that will not go away. As well as taking a look at the wider forces that could shape Liverpool's transfer plans and strategy through discussing a couple of pieces written by the two men I have with me today that have gone online this morning. Uh, we'll also have a little word on what's going on in Austria with Klopp putting his squad through their paces in pre-season training. But first, there is only really one place to start at the moment. The, the topic that's dominating a lot of Liverpool's fans' thoughts on social media is the weekend's events in Portugal involving two teams from a city just along the M62. So, yeah, we'll, we'll start with City and we'll move on to United just to have a, a quick look at events in the European competitions. Uh, City, as everyone knows, their, their season ended with, with just the League Cup to show for the last years. They were dumped out of the Champions League with a 3-1 defeat by Leon. Um, it's Bernardo Silva. I just want to want to start with, must be said, there was, there was much mirth on, on social media after the results. It's obviously a bit of a strange time at the moment, isn't it? There's uh, a lot of people cooped up with not much to do. The game was on a Saturday night. NFC have the wind in their sails, uh, so there was a bit of outpouring on Twitter well, once City got knocked out, which I guess it's understandable, isn't it? As long as it doesn't go too far, it's all part of football. But Bernardo Silva, I want to read this directly. For those who haven't seen it, on Sunday he sent a tweet addressed to Liverpool fans and it said, to all the Liverpool fans that have nothing else to do and to come to a Man City player account, I'm sorry for you, but for the wrong reasons. Laughing emoji, epic. Go celebrate your titles or try to find a partner, drink a beer with a friend, read a book, face palm emoji. So many options, laughing emoji. Dorsey, I'll start with you first of all. What did you make of this from Bernardo? I mean, he must have taken some, some serious volume of stick, shall we, shall we call it politely, for him to um, kind of fight back so spectacularly. Um, Look, there's no secret is that between the two fan bases at the moment that it's, it's been a growing animosity now for a good couple of years. It doesn't really extend to the to the coaching staff because we know that Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola, whilst not best friends and not particularly close, there is an underlying, huge underlying respect between the two coaches, with, which there should be as arguably the two greatest around at the moment. But in terms of the, the players clashing with each other, we've seen Joe Gomez and Raheem Sterling. Um, you know, it must have hurt City badly for them to give Liverpool a guard of honour at the Etihad. And I think this is where a lot of it's come from. You know, if you look at those pictures, Bernardo Silva was one who was very visibly not not given at the round of applause. So I think Liverpool fans have taken to Twitter on Saturday night with a little bit of glee and delight in the fact that City have been bumped out to a team who they should be beaten. No, no two ways about it. This is a team who was seventh in France. Um, and he's just... He's just, he's just, you know, trying to fire back, and he's probably lost his head, hasn't he? And and it, it can happen. Um, I can I can only imagine the amount of tweets he's had to have seen and viewed before he's finally decided decided to fire back. But you know, when you're a multi-million pound footballer, you're probably best just staying off it for for a while, aren't you? You know, lying low, keeping your head down, and ignoring it because he's he's only made it worse tenfold now, and and he's in the news for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, I think Gorsley makes a fair point there, Joe. I mean, we're we're caught up in the in the push and pull of social media every day, aren't we? In, in our line of work, and you know, you, you see some of the things that get directed at players, and even at the Echo account sometimes. <laughs> Do you think it is it an understandable reaction? I mean, I think it was perhaps ill advised for, for Silver to comment in that way before 
he had given himself a chance to simmer down, as, as Gorsley suggests. Uh, and no doubt he'll, he'll be on the end of plenty of stick. But what did you make of it? Does he does he partly have a point? I mean, it, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's, I'm sure a lot of it will be light-hearted stuff, you know, banter with him. But others, I'm sure, we know what social media is like. We know people will probably have been quite abusive towards him. So I can understand why he's, he's so wound up. But, um, you know, I don't think... I don't know whether there's someone at the club advising him, but I'm pretty sure they'd have said to him, don't, don't respond to it, don't rise to it. Um, and, you know, if I was a footballer, you know, as he says about having better things to do, I'd, I'd try and find better things to do than be on, on Twitter because it's just not a place, you know, that, for him to be. And, and you're not really going to get much nice interactions with fans, even your own fans. You know, we've, we've, seen, we've seen players getting abused by their own fans before and there. So it's just not the nicest place to be. Look, I think in terms of, it's a little bit funny, you know, I think the, the stuff that I've read is all quite lighthearted and I've read some of the responses to his, um, to his, you know, go and find something to do, go and find a partner, which is nice of him, go and find a partner, um, go find love during COVID. Um, <laughs> but I, I read some of the responses to it and it's just made it 10 times worse. You know, people, people were having a lot of fun with it. But um, I do think, you know, I've seen a lot of people denying this, but I think Liverpool are a little bit in City's heads. You know, I, I, perhaps I'm I'm looking at this from a through red tinted glasses here, but you know, you see a lot of things that Pep says quite unwarranted about Liverpool. He often mentions them in in post match press conferences and stuff. You hear the players say things. You know, obviously Sterling has history with Liverpool. You know, Bernardo Silva was one. I think I'm pretty sure he was one of the players that was caught singing on the plane about Liverpool. You know, a lot of the first team players, quite bizarrely, you know, you don't think that they would join in with, with certain chants, um, especially with a, of a not very nice nature. Um, but they were joining in with that weren't they, a couple of years ago. And it does, there does seem to be something about City. And I think maybe it's, it's Pep with this everyone against us, us against the world style management that, you know, he's got them quite riled up about their rivals. And, you know, you can, you can almost see it's almost a bit of self-sabotage by City because I think that Liverpool are so in their heads that they're going into games, you know, looking at looking to try and overhaul Liverpool and just win a game. So, you know, I think Liverpool really shouldn't have been on, on any of their minds after being knocked out of the Champions League because it was a massive chance for them to win it. You know, I think Bayern Munich are by far away the strongest team left in it. But, you know, there's no, there's no saying that Man City wouldn't beat them and... And then the rest of the teams, you know, Paris Saint-Germain, we know that they have their, their problems. Leon really were there to be beaten, albeit they are a good side. And, you know, and, and Leipzig are the other one, aren't they? So I, th I think City had a great chance to win it and they'll be kicking themselves. And I think that's Bernardo Silva was just very frustrated. But it's very bizarre that his frustration is aimed at Liverpool, you know. And I do think that is a is something that has become unhealthy for City. And we've seen other managers do it before. Jose Mourinho was a very good us-against-the-world style manager. But it kind of spilled in, you know, later in his career, spilled over to, to just really taking swipes at other teams. And, and Guardiola, I think, has got some work to do to just reset at City. Because, again, the, the final thing I'd say is that, you know, looking at social media, I've seen there's a bit of revisionism with Guardiola, people saying that, you know, for the money he spent, he's not done this or that. That's true. He hasn't won the European Cup. But, I mean, you can't deny what he's done. You know, he's, he's produced... Uh, expensive one, but one of the best ever sides we've, we've ever seen in English football, you know, broken points records, won domestic trophies for absolute fun. And yeah, he hasn't, he hasn't won, won the Champions League, but I think he needs to reset now and, and just try and refresh that squad and, and get them just thinking about winning things again and stop being so caught up about Liverpool because it, it's not healthy. And, and Klopp does the opposite in Liverpool, doesn't he? You know, there's no, I don't think you've seen many Liverpool players fixating on City and you know, Klopp might say the odd thing, but I don't think after every game he's he's fixating on City. So I think um, I think they just need to reset there and, and get back to what they do best. With this City side, course, I mean you, you can never underestimate them, as Joe says. And there's there's a resolve and a resourcefulness to the manager. Obviously, there's there's a massive spending power there. I think we'll we'll see the evidence of that over the summer. We have started to see that already. Does there come a point, you think, when, when it genuinely does seem like it's just not going to happen for them in, in this competition, in, in the Champions League? And it does feel like, after the other night, especially watching that, that like it might have arrived at that point. Because 
it, it's become a pattern really, hasn't it, where Guardiola starts overthinking it every time they get to this stage of the competition and then and suddenly they, they find themselves crashed out. It, it is. I, I, th- I think I think you, you summed it up there with Guardiola's overthinking. It's almost reminiscent of Rafa Benitez at certain times, worrying too much about the strengths of of the opposition when they're, they're clearly the superior side. I mean, Liverpool didn't win the league in 2009 because of too many draws against teams that they should have been beaten. They should have been on the front foot more, went out and, and attacked a lot more. And you see, see similarities in the way City go about certain big games in the Champions League. Like Saturday night, they, they, had, they had Kevin De Bruyne, who was meant to be in a wide right of a front three, and he, he was dropping deep to the halfway line, and there just didn't really seem to be any kind of cohesion to the team and if, if Guardiola had just played his, his natural select 11 they'd have gone out and won comfortably I'm sure even though Leon have got quite a few threats with Memphis Depay and, and you know um, Dembele off the bench and, and who are in, in midfield he looks like a, a fantastic player but um, I do think he does kind of because he's so almost neurotic that may be a bit harsh but kind of in his own thoughts that he's just overcomplicating things and that's why they keep coming a cropping in games. They should be winning. Um, whereas Klopp is very much of a different mindset. And, you know, Liverpool, with, with him being Liverpool manager, they go out to focus on their own strengths rather than worry about the oppositions and, and see who gets the best out of it. And often it does seem to be Liverpool. Do you think, Joe, that this kind of experience and once again being dumped out of Europe will, will have much of a bearing on next season and could you know, frame the start of the title race, at least with Liverpool, because I suppose you look at it two ways, can't you? Like City will get a bit more rest now ahead of what's going to be a gruelling and compacted season and schedule, but surely, I mean, they won't exactly have flown back to Manchester in high spirits after that. No, I mean, look, as I said before, I do think there's a little bit of mental weakness there at City, you know, whereas Liverpool at the moment look very, very strong and that that can always change, you know, you start losing games or something gets on your mind and, and then that can change, but City do seem to be slightly mentally weak in some of the bigger games at the moment, and it's not something they had in the past. I do wonder whether losing characters like Company um, has changed that, and, and whether they need big characters again. But we know what they like, and they'll go and spend a lot of money. Um, so the City side that starts the Premier League season, or, or at least plays in the, the first few months of the Premier League season, I think will eventually look quite different um, to the City side that, that ended this season. You know, let's face it, that they've been linked with Koulibaly. And you think if they can go and get big characters and, and expensive players like that, then they'll come again. I just think they've got too much money not to come again. And Pep is a great manager. You know, he, he's dreadling, isn't he? And that, that's what makes him, you know, almost at times like a bit of a lunatic on the touchline, just like Klopp. They're mm-hmm. so driven. Um, you know, it, it makes him bitter and angry sometimes and, and snarky because he's just so driven to win. So I think they'll come back strong, I think. Still think they will be Liverpool's closest challengers next year, and I still think it'll be a fight between them two. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if we see the the great Man City again. So, you know, I'll never write them off. That they're, they're just such a good side, and, and when it's on song for them, uh, you know, they're, they're great. But they've lost a lot of games this season. Um, you know, a lot more than than any of us expected, and I do think there's a little bit of mental weakness there. So they need to get that sorted. But chances are they'll spend a hell of a lot of money to do that. Indeed. Um, well, we'll move on from Saturday night to Sunday night then. And there was uh, another treat for Reds fans as, as United took the European competition. Um, took the lead against Sevilla, naturally, from the penalty spot, but then succumbed to a 2-1 defeat, uh, which sent them out of the Europa League. And again, there was plenty of reaction to this one on social media and elsewhere. Uh, and there's two little strands that I want to pick up on. And we'll start with you, Gorsley, first of all. That the mirrors Dave Maddock tweeted after the game, um, possibly... You know, with, with a bit of a wink to this tweet, but he, but he said, I think it's fair to suggest this United team is at a similar point of evolution as the Liverpool side, which lost to Sevilla in a similar manner in the 2016 Europa League final. Would, would you go along with that? Do you think United are kind of on that same path as the Reds were then? I mean, the, the only similarities I can find is the fact that Sevilla have schooled them in the Europa League and, and Sevilla... All, you know, almost every season seems to be contesting this Europa League final. I don't think they might as well rename it after them for the last 15 years. Um, I think I think this United team should be a lot further along in the development than the one that Jürgen Klopp had, had been in charge of seven or eight months. Because, OK, they have had transitions of managers and so on, but they've spent an incredible amount of money. They're the most expensive defender playing, you know, playing at the back there and Harry Maguire and... 
Um, it's just a just a. I mean, it's a very exciting front three, and Bruno Fernandez and Pogba seem to be working in tandem in flashes. But there does seem to be a real problem at the back. You know, Brandon Williams is a young lad who's still learning his trade. Um, I'm not convinced by Adam Wambasaka. He looks tenacious when you've got to sit in and low block and defend and dig in. But is he a fifty million pound fullback? No, uh, Rick Lindelof has never really convinced me. Maguire, as we say, question marks are still there over him, and there's a huge one over the goalkeeper at the moment. So, when all that combines, you think that they've still got a hell of a lot to go. And when, when you look at how much they've spent, it's incredible, really. But um, they, I mean, I can't really see too many similarities to, to the one to the team that's, that that Liverpool turned out with in 2016. Yeah, had Alberto Moreno, who you know, there were question marks over him. So there are kind of issues at the back that, that did need rectifying and Jürgen Klopp went out and spent the money and did that. But United are going out and spending the money and not doing it. So it's um it's a difficult one to kind of line up and, and compare like for like. But um there's no question the pool have come on so much since that defeat in, in Basel. That would have been straight back into the Champions League. Um they had to play another year before they got in there. Who knows how that might have kind of accelerated the development under Klopp, but, um, you know, the pool are, are miles away from, from where they were that night in Baal. And, and turn it to you, Joe. Um, I thought it was quite interesting, some of Paul Scholes' comments in the wake of the game. Um, he was doing some of the TV punditry. In one quote in particular, he said, we all know this Sancho stuff's going on. They need to spend more money. If they want to win trophies, they've got to start spending the money. Well, it's fair to say they've been doing that for a fair few seasons, isn't it? Yeah, they've spent a hell of a lot of money. Like, like Gorsi said, I think the difference between them and Liverpool is Liverpool have spent money and, and got things right and they've spent money and got things wrong. You know, I think Maguire is a good example. I, th I think he's a good centre-half, but their signing of Maguire was almost in a direct reaction to Liverpool getting Van Dijk and they paid £75 million and then you know United had to go and pay a bit more for a centre-half who really wasn't as good. And I just don't think... I, I, I'm certain that that, that wasn't the, the homework wasn't done as well as it was when Liverpool signed Van Dijk. You know, I'm sure there was better value out there, but it was like, who's the next best centre half? Who's outside the top four playing in the Premier League? He's English. He's Harry Maguire. He'll cost a lot of money, and and, and it's those sorts of signings that I just don't think get you get you anywhere near as far as you need to go. So I think they've got a lot of work to do. I see what Maddo was saying. I, I think. But I just think the difference between Liverpool and United, and I, and I think he hinted at this afterwards, Dave. So, so um, you know, I, I think his tweet, you were meant to read between the lines a little bit. But, you know, Liverpool and United, if they are where they were when Liverpool reached the Europa League final those years ago, Liverpool had Klopp. And, you know, United have got Solskjaer and, and Klopp was leading the team in the right direction. I think Solskjaer's done a decent job, but I'm not convinced he is anywhere near the manager that, that Klopp was, that Klopp is. And, I just think there's a hell of a lot of work for them to do. You know, I think to me at the moment, Solskjaer still strikes me as a bit of a momentum manager. He seems to get them into really good runs of form, but then, you know, they lose big games or, or have setbacks or spells that, that cost them. So um, they've been good since lockdown was lifted and they, they kind of came back quite strong from there. But we'll see what they're like next season. And, and even the Sancho one, you know, I think obviously Sancho is going to improve any side, but I don't quite understand why they throw money at Sancho when. You know, I'm not too sure whether the front three is um, the, the, the area of their team um, that, that, that needs fixing that much. You know, there seems to be areas of midfield or perhaps defence that are more pressing. Um, but yeah, I mean, even Bruno Fernandes, I, th I think I've seen, I haven't seen that much of him in a lot of games, but I think I've seen people talking about him and, you know, take away the penalties. Has he, has he been quite as good as... As, as, as you'd hope, I'm not too sure. You know, will United keep winning that many penalties? Well, I'd say they won't. So, you know, there's a lot of work for them to do. I, I don't think, I don't think they're anywhere near at Liverpool's level, and they will need to spend money because that's the way, you know, that's the way teams do it now. Don't they? They spend a lot of money, and let's face it, Liverpool have to spend big money to get where they are. But they also have the trump card of Jurgen Klopp, and um, you know, I'm pretty sure United would would give anything for Jurgen Klopp. Never mind the players. That the manager makes a difference at Liverpool, and they'll know it. Well, moving on directly to the Reds, then um, let's talk about Thiago, a man who I think is going to make guest appearances on pretty much every podcast until this window closes. 
Ghosty, we'll, we'll start with you on this, and, and we want to touch on obviously the the wider financial picture as well. And um, I think I mentioned earlier this, we've had a couple of stories today from 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 you guys on the website. Your piece on Tiago Ghosty went online this morning. For anyone listening who's not read it yet, it's well worth a read. It's an overview of kind of what we know so far, what we've been told. Uh, about the situation and it's a question you've answered several times Paul and I know that will do again but where where do you think stand on Thiago at the moment? Same same <laughs> four weeks ago as far as we're, we're led to believe um, actually asked the question again for the fourth time on Sunday and was told probably probably most forcibly actually yesterday that um, this is a transfer that uh, is, is rooted in fantasy and I was watching BT Sports um, very well put together club 2020 just before we come on air um, and there was talk of Thiago to Liverpool and they're showing the tweets from certain journalists and it's all well what's Thiago going to bring to Liverpool this that and the other he signed a four-year deal he's got his house and I'm sitting there watching it and thinking you know do, 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 do what, what the club are saying not does, does that not come into it anymore you know the, the buying club who were saying that this is all not happening and, and not happening and you know I think it, I don't know whether it's just one that Liverpool fans want to happen. He's a fabulous player. There's no question about it. He's one of the best midfielders in Europe, and it, and you only had to watch him on on Friday night to dismantle Barcelona's midfield to show how good this player is. But wanting a player is is different to what's actually happening, and this is what our job is to report what what we believe faithfully um, with our contacts and sources that we believe is happening, and and we believe um, that this is a transfer that, that won't happen, and and. Some fans might moan and say, but he's no nothing, he's no this, that and the other, which is fine. You know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. But I think I look back to Nicholas Pepe 12 months ago. It, so many similarities, you know, Pepe was a done deal and Pepe was coming in and he wasn't, was he? He went to Arsenal for 71 million. Um, and it's almost, it's very hard to not put your, put your hand up on social media when stuff like that happens and think, I told you so, because of the stick that comes along with the job. But... You stay professional, and, and it is our understanding that Thiago Alcantara is not currently a Liverpool target, even though reports are suggesting he's bought his house, whatever that may be. <laughs> Tell us your piece, then, Joe. You, you've written around the why the financial picture and why what seems to be a patient and cautious approach from the Reds to this window and, and all the uncertainty that it brings in, in the current climate is is the right approach. So yeah, I mean, talk us through that because. You raised some interesting points in it about some some potential warning signs elsewhere. Yeah, well, there was there was three stories that, that sort of yeah, caught my attention over the weekend. And the first was there's one coming out of Spain that Real Madrid are starting to feel the pinch a little bit. You know, um, they're apparently a club that that earns a lot of money through stadium visits, through museum tours, through those sorts of things. And um, you know, I'm sure sure Liverpool are in a similar boat in terms of Anfield being such a famous stadium and whatnot. And, and um and also sponsorship deals at Real Madrid, you know sponsors like Adidas and and uh, Fly Emirates, sort of saying, look, you know, we're struggling here. We're not sure we can honour the terms of of our contracts. And that was the first one. And then I saw another one about Southampton sponsor a Chinese company, I think LD Sports, saying that you know that apparently that they are close to sort of pulling the plug on their sponsorship deal, a three year sponsorship deal with Southampton. Um, and then of course going further back, Arsenal. And the, the sorry the um, the redundancies they've made there. So you know I think there are warning signs that you know that this idea that I think people are almost trying to dismiss COVID and saying you know, big clubs are you know are bulletproof towards this and I don't think they are. I think oil rich clubs like Manchester City might be okay. You know Chelsea are another oil rich club, but don't forget they received a lot of money for Eden Hazard last summer and had a transfer ban. So they've been selling players and, and not not buying. So you know that. They probably have more money in the bank, bank plus, the, plus an oil rich owner. Um, whereas Liverpool have always operated in, in a you know self sufficient style. So, so of course Liverpool have to be aware of of the financial implications of, of this awful awful crisis that the world is seeing. So, so to me, you know, having a patient approach, having a clever approach, is the right approach because you know someone like Costas, you can cover his fee with a with a Dejan Lovren, and um, you know, and and then. Should the worst happen, um, you know, you, you will be covered. And I think Liverpool have done that very, very well. It's got them, you know, to the, the absolute pinnacle of football. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, people always want owners and, and whatnot to pump money in. But why tear up a business plan that, that's brought you so so much success? And especially at a time when, 
the, the, the team is not in need of major reconstruction. You know, it, it's very, very good. They've got things going on us off the pitch, like the training ground and the new stand that they're still pushing ahead with. So, you know, there's still a lot of money being spent. I just don't think they need to start pouring it in for certain players. So, I like Liverpool's careful approach. I think it should be respected. And and the last thing, the, the last point to make on that really is, you know, we look at we look at Arsenal and what happened there, and it's and it's awful. You know, the, the redundancies being made in many many countries across the uh, companies across the country. So it's terrible. And and the last thing you ever want to see is is any company make redundancies. And, and I'm not suggesting for a minute that Liverpool need to or will do, but they have a duty of start care to the staff that are there now. You know, the playing staff, the, the coaches. The staff that work at the wider club, everyone there, and you know that's why the company and the, the football club has to be run responsibly. So you know, I, I I respect what they do. I really like what they do, and I think you know I'd like to see more people respect what they do. And you know, transfers might be glamorous, but they're not necessarily needed. Um, and I'd like to pick up something on, on the, the following up on what what Gorsi was saying about Thiago as well, because. I do think this is important, you know, and, and, and it goes along with the financial things, is, is context. You know, people want us to report immediately on what's happening now. They always want to know what's going on. And um, right now, you know, everything we're being told is Tiago's not a target. Tiago's not a target. Could that change? Well, you know, Gorsley will know better than me, but, but, you know, common sense says it could because Klopp's a admirer. They've, they, Liverpool have a player, Gini Van Adam, who's got a year left in his contract. Let's say he left. If Thiago then becomes a target, that that is the nature of the transfer market. Things change, you know. A lot of people throw Danny Ward. That is, I often see that on Twitter. But you know, I, but I, but I go back to that and think, place that within the context of the time. You know, Liverpool were negotiating for Alison Becker from Roma. Um, Roma wanted ninety million. Liverpool said that's ridiculous. We are not paying that. Real Madrid were hanging round. So Liverpool walked away and said, for the, for the time being, Danny Ward will be our number one. Um, and that's what we reported. We never said, we always said that, that Alisson was a target. We never said that he was no longer a target, but Liverpool have pulled out because of the price. Real Madrid signed a new goalkeeper in Courtois. Roma suddenly dropped their price because they did need to sell. Liverpool got back involved and signed the goalkeeper. Context changes everything. And when we're reporting on a daily basis, things you have to remember that. So with Thiago, it's, it's a difficult one because, you know, like Gorsi says, the club have been consistent. He's not. He's not. He's not a target. And then you have, you know, <laughs> let's face it, very conflicting reports. We've had Liverpool are opening negotiations with Bayern Munich. Then we're being told Liverpool will open negotiations with Bayern Munich after they've been knocked out Champions League. But which mm. is it? Why would he have chosen a house in Liverpool? Think about it. That that makes it makes no sense. The club put players up, don't they? So if you if you put the pieces together. There's a lot of conflicting reports going around about Thiago, but the one constant in all this is the club's position that right now he's not a target. So, you know, make of it what you will and believe what you like. Um, you know, there are, I'm sure there are agents involved. Thiago's 29, he's got a year left on his contract and probably, you know, quite rightfully is looking for a big move somewhere. Um, you know, Man City's name was mentioned and that quickly got battered away. So, Liverpool just seems to be the club that's the striving this is the sorry the club that you know is is being used to drive the interest we'll, we'll see where it ends up but right now the one consistent thing is that Thiago is my target um and you know we'll, we'll see what happens but I don't know whether that will change unless big changes are made to Liverpool's playing squad uh, in terms of outgoings hmm. I think that, that is fair ghosty isn't it I mean as, as you said and as you've reported the club's position on Thiago has been consistent I think as well it's fair to say that the club's position on the broader financial outlook has been quite consistent. So, I mean, obviously, we, we'd all agree that the initial decision made on, on Fairlow was was an error. And, you know, thankfully, that was reversed. That was the right decision by the club. But I think when that when that U-turn was announced, I think it was Peter Moore, wasn't it, who, who accompanied that by making very clear how much of a challenge Liverpool and other clubs face in, in the current climate. And that just can't be denied, can it, at the moment? No, I'm, I'm not sure they. I mean, again, it, it's one of those things that, that some people don't want to hear, but it's a, it's a fact, isn't it? You know, Liverpool between mid March and the end of June had no income for match days, had no income for TV broadcasting deals. I'm still paying out one of the highest wage bills in, in football at 310 million. So I think between those months, it worked out at around about 80 million that they paid out without any money coming in. And that was just on wages alone. And 
Joe mentions the Arsenal redundancies there. 55 people being made redundant to Arsenal, who were one of the biggest clubs in the world, let alone England, a club who probably on a similar part to Liverpool. So if they're letting 55 people go from their, their staff across so many different areas, then why would Liverpool be in that much more of a healthy financial position? The Emirates um, earns more money on a match day than, than Anfield does, which is around £3 million. So Liverpool losing £3 million per home game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's as much as people may turn the nose about it and just think that it's not a thing and think it's just a convenient excuse, it's not. And it's the reason why Manchester United are refusing to pay the money for Sancho because at the moment they can't quite justify it because they're not getting that, that money coming in. It's it's affecting every team in the world. Um, but the ones who are a little bit more insulated from it are the ones who've got the, the you know, the the oil barons of their owners like Chelsea and, and Manchester City and PSG. Mm. Timo Werner, I think, is a, is a good example. You know, we talk about context, but Timo Werner was a player that we know Liverpool liked, we know Liverpool were considering. But I've no doubt in my mind that if Liverpool could have got him to wait, they might have considered him later in the window. But they couldn't, at that point in time, spend £50 million on Timo Werner without knowing what was going to come next. Imagine if they'd done that, you know, committed that sort of finances to, towards Timo Werner and then been told, OK, fans are coming back to the stadium for another season or such and such is cancelled. Or, or, you know, it, it it was very difficult for Liverpool to make that financial outplay. And they, outlay and they, and they basically played a bit of a game of chicken, didn't they? And, and hoped that he would he would stand still and, 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 and sort of hope for a move to Liverpool. But then Chelsea came in with the money from, from Eden Hazard, you know, and perhaps the owner and... and, and you know, showed their hand and, and pushed through a deal and, and I don't think he was willing to wait. He'd seen a, a move to Bayern Munich break down. So it's all about context and Liverpool had to make a choice right then and there without really knowing what the future held. So, you know, it, it was one that, you know, a lot of fans were, were disappointed about, but ultimately it was the sensible the sensible choice, wasn't it? You know, I think Liverpool had to make it and, um, you know, I'm sure Klopp would have loved to have worked with Timo Werner, but they, they couldn't do it then and there. You know, what's the, that might change towards the end of the window. We we don't know yet. You know, fans might be allowed back in stadiums. We'll see. But you know, I think that's a good example of the uncertainty of the transfer market at the moment. I also think there was a there was a big concern at Liverpool that how it would look. You know, the optics as they say of spending fifty million pounds on one player six weeks after they were threatening to furlough members of staff in in the restaurants who were on. You know, not you know it's not it's not a huge salary, is it? So. I think there, there was a legitimate concern about that. And if you look at what Jürgen Klopp said quite recently, actually, he said, it's all about time and we need to look and see what happens and see what develops. And that's fair, isn't it? He said, it's always better to know when you qualify for the Champions League as quickly as you can because you know you're getting that income and um, then you can kind of start planning. But it's just a just a year unlike any other, isn't it, in terms of football finances. And, and that is, is one of the one of the reasons why Liverpool didn't make Timo Werner their player, I think. Absolutely. Well, as you as you say, gents, plenty of variables, but also plenty of time left. There's no in this window, best part of a couple of months. So I'm sure there will be twists and turns to come. Uh, lastly, then, just want to have a little little word on uh, Austria and what's going on with the Reds out in their pre-season training camp. Uh, of course, you, you've had a, a line this morning. So most of the squad are out there and, and are involved in including uh, Costa Simicas. He looks like he's getting stuck in and uh, climatised to life as a Red. But no Trent. And you've had an update on why? Yeah, it was one of those things that we kind of noticed, didn't we? And, and then so many people on Twitter yesterday were asking me, where's Trent, where's Trent? So um done a little bit of digging today. And it's quite a simple one, really. He's um, he's carrying a minor injury, so he's staying behind to work at home on the regime, the tailored programme that, that basically all the players got last week before they flew out because the players, in the same way they were in lockdown, they've been working from home for over a week because Liverpool... Um, didn't want to give them too long off with, with so much at stake in such a short turnaround. So he's remained at home just to carry on his, his training regime. They thought that with the club having to kind of change plans so quickly in terms of France popping up on the quarantine list, they had to move plans from Evian to Austria in, in Saffelden, I think it's pronounced. Um, so uh, with, with that short turnaround and, and a little bit of a, a, a last minute change, it was just decided that Trent Alexander-Arnold would be better off staying at home and working on his, his own individual fitness. Um, and the same applies to Harry Wilson. And um, if you can say that both players are carrying injuries at the moment, there's no suggestion that it's going to keep either out of the Community Shield later this month. So 
um, all all fairly um, fairly routine, really. And just there uh, before we finish, then what, what what's been your impression, Joe, of all of the picks, vids, reports that have come from uh, Australia for a start? It looks like an absolutely stunning place to to trade. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing I'd say. You know, be saying, can't we switch Melbourne for here and just trade here, <laughs> here or here, here around? Fly in for the matches. It's um, it looks stunning, doesn't it? I think um, I was reading some interviews with Klopp from the, on the on the official website. And he was saying that you know this is his favourite time of year. Um, you know it's quite secluded. He can just work with the players and yeah, they look like they're they having a good time. They look refreshed and um, you know it's it's always exciting, isn't it? You know this time of year, even though it hasn't been a, a long break. You know I always find these little pre-season camps. You know the, the new kit, the new players involved, some of the younger players coming in. Um, Billy K for um, because I can't pronounce his surname. Big Billy K, looking 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 the business there. So yeah, you know I saw a little video of um, Harvey Elliott um, and um, setting up uh, Minamino for a lovely little bit of skill from Harvey Elliott crossing for Minamino to score. So um, a lot a lot to be excited about. You know I really like this time of year and you know can't wait to see what comes next. Um, I'm not too sure Liverpool haven't, haven't lined up any friendlies yet, have they, Paul? So I'm, I'm sure there'll be some friendlies to come, but yeah, we don't have to wait as long and, and then a bit of Premier League football returns. So it's a bit strange, isn't it, considering Man City have just played the other night and, uh, you know, one season's still seemingly continuing as another one starts. But yeah, um, it's good to see the Reds out in Austria. I think, I think one of the interesting things of, of this pre-season tour is it's not, it's the start of pre-season, but it's the week the clock club loves where all the, all the money spinning tours of the US and wherever else are over with and this is his time to work with his players and it's not a traditional beginning of pre-season in terms of the lactate test and hard running and focusing on the fitness because the players have only just finished haven't they so they've only had a week off and they've been working from home and um, carrying on their fitness regimes and now they're back in training so um, I was told on Saturday that the coaching staff there are expecting the players to be a lot more sharp than what they normally would be at this time of year a lot fitter a um, lot more up to speed, and hopefully they can they can hit the ground running. Obviously, when the community shield kicks off um, a week on Saturday. Absolutely right. Well, well, that will do us as ever. Thank you all for listening, watching, however and wherever you uh, tune into Blood Red. This has been Monday's pod, and we will be back with plenty more on Friday as that community shield against Arsenal creeps closer and closer. Uh, so yeah, nice one. Thanks for listening, and bye for now. <laughs>